recommendations for APAC occupiers in changing market conditions. On behalf of Collier's Asia Pacific, I'm delighted to bring you the first in what will be a series of webinars on recommendations to occupiers in the wake of COVID-19. Myself, Sam Hobby Jones, Head of Occupier Services Asia, Andrew Haskins, Head of Asia Research, James Armstrong, Head of Workplace Management Services Australia, will be sharing with you our insights and recommendations based on the short, medium, and long-term focus areas and recommendations that we're currently seeing in the marketplace. I'm delighted to report that Collier's, from a personal perspective, has seen and come through this relatively undamaged, and our people are all safe and sound. I trust it's the same for all of you, and uh, everyone is staying safe in these uncertain times. Over the last month or so, it has been absolutely fantastic to see such collaboration and connectivity, both internally and externally, as we all get to grips with what, as I said, is such a unique set of circumstances. I would like to thank all of our teams and our clients for showing the power of working to, together to uh, achieving this success. The college remains fully open for business across the region. And as you can imagine, it's in a variety of different uh, styles and guises at the moment. But suffice to say, we are dedicated, we are on tap, and we're here to support you and your stakeholders 24 seven. As we go through this webinar, please send in your questions. And after the session, we will collate them and post answers on the Collier's APAP microsite. Uh, further details of that will be at the end of this presentation. And also we'll send that out uh, via email. Uh, there's also a checklist at the end. Um, please feel free to complete this. Uh, this shows you some of the areas that we feel that you should be focusing on and looking at. And then we can help provide further advice in a timely manner. And finally, we will at the end of this be sending out a recording of this presentation and the slides for you to be able to share with yourselves and your teams and to be able to follow up with the Collier's individuals across the region. So what is our agenda for today? So what we really want to focus on is these four areas. In a minute, I'm going to hand over to Andrew Haskins, who's going to give us a market overview. And then James and myself are going to focus on the key impacts to Asia Pacific occupiers and the recommendations. For points two and three, we're very much going to look at some of the shorter term initiatives that we're seeing, some of the focus areas that we feel our clients should be looking at. We'll also then tie in some of those medium term recommendations and where possible some of the longer term recommendations as well. Ultimately, as I say, today is on the short term, but we want to make sure that where possible, people are able to build in medium and longer term recommendations to have the biggest impact on their portfolios going forward. Suffice to say that I think everyone on this call is going through the same two situations uh, internally and probably both from a personal perspective as well. And we're gonna very much focus on the welfare of people, the human side, and also then from a business perspective at profitability, both in the short term around performance in 2020, but also in terms of how uh, we can come out of this in a more sustain sustainable manner in both the medium to long term. It goes without saying that we are in unique times. It's unprecedented. As we go through this, it's very much an evolution. If you get further updates, please connect with the Collier's teams in markets. We can give you real-time recommendations and real-time solutions based on the things that we're seeing as they evolve day to day. So I'm now just going to hand over to Andrew Haskins, who is going to give us an overview of the market. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody, thank you very much for joining this call. Thank you, Sam. As Sam mentioned, uh, my name is Andrew Haskins. I am the head of uh, Asia Research uh, for Colliers. Let me please take you through an overview uh, of the Asia Pacific markets uh, and of how they are being uh, affected uh, by COVID-19. Let us start by summarizing the situation. Following the lessons of SARS in 2003, we and Colliers originally assumed that activity in Asia Pacific occupier markets would rebound from the impact of COVID-19 from about the, uh, the early part of the second half of this year. However, the global spread of COVID-19 over the last three weeks or so suggests this rebound may be pushed back perhaps three to six months. 
it is not all bad news. COVID-19 has clearly already peaked in China. Empl employees are starting to return to their workplaces. The official Chinese manufacturing purchase, purchasing uh, managers, managers index for, mark, for March showed that manufacturing has started to rebound. That is very good. However, COVID-19 continues to spread uh, elsewhere in the region, perhaps particularly in India, uh, which is now under national lockdown. So let's look through some of the major markets starting with the tier one cities in China. If you take a look at the disruption dial, we can say disruption is high, but is starting to decline. Now you certainly see the high impact uh, of the disruption in real GDP growth forecasts. These forecasts are from Oxford Economics. Just 1% now seems likely for 2020. That will be the weakest figure since the 1970s. But just look at the scale of the rebound in 2021, going right back to 8.4%. If we put the tier one cities together and simplifying somewhat, demand is under pressure with net absorption, weak or even negative uh, in some of the cities. Supply is heavy, particularly uh, in Shanghai, uh, and the combination of weakening, uh, weakening demand and, and high new supply is rising vacancy. Uh, and therefore, we will see rent levels under pressure. In the first quarter, we saw rents fall in Shanghai and Beijing by about two and a half to three percent. And we're talking about four to six percent declines for the full year for those two cities. Uh, less perhaps for Shenzhen and Guangzhou. Actually, those numbers are reasonably resilient given uh, the severity of the circumstances. How can we best describe the current situation? Colley has carried out a survey of over 700 occupiers, landlords, and investors in early February. At that time, 45% of tenants had seen their business decline. Those, that, that proportion is probably picking up now. Which sectors stood out as being resilient? Pharmaceuticals, healthcare, software and IT, uh, telecoms, anything to do with uh, online retailing. Some landlords we know ha have offered smaller tenants rental, and uh, rental abatements. The situation will be tough uh, this year, perhaps next year as well. Pressures on demand and high supply mean rents overall may not rebound till 2022. Let's take a look uh, at Hong Kong SAR. Anybody in Hong Kong will <laughs> be aware of the pressures uh, that this market faces, the lingering effects of last year's protests, the side effects of US-China trade tension, pressures on the uh, important uh, finance sector, and now, of course, COVID-19. Hong Kong was in recession last year uh, and will remain in a recession this year with 3.5% negative growth, something like that. But then again, a strong rebound to 3.9% uh, next year. If you look at the disruption uh, gauge, buy but coming down, demand under pressure, uh, net absorption is weak, but supply this year at least uh, is also uh, very weak. So vacancy rising, but very gradually. Rents are under some pressure. We think average Hong Kong rents will fall by 10% this year, uh, and rents in central will fall by 13%, but with stabilization in the latter part of the year. With stabilization uh, later in the year, we think existing occupiers should act to restructure leases now while the downturn persists. In Asia in general, we are recommending decentralization. In Hong Kong, tactically, however, we are saying that well-established occupiers can now take a look uh, at Central again, which provides more options in the light of falling rents and gradually rising vacancy. Singapore, 
Look at the disruption dial, medium to low and unchanged. Singapore will feel some impact uh, from the situation this year, of course, it from COVID-19 this year, of course it will. But for Singapore, we are probably talking about minus 1% growth with a sharp upswing to 4.3% in 2021. Vacancy is rising, but from a from a from a pretty low base, demand is moderating, but, but from a pretty high base. Supply is increasing, but from a very low base, we do not expect a major supply hike until 2022. And therefore, rents will probably get, grow by about 1% this year. Let's call it stable. Singapore overall has shown a strong policy response, which confirms its reputation as a safe haven for, occupy, for occupiers. Office leasing will slow in the short term as occupiers are rationalizing their long-term space needs. But with five-year rent growth of over three percent, uh, this remains one of the one of the strongest markets in Asia. Occupiers have good reason to try to lock in deals this year. Japan, a similar picture to Singapore. Disruption from COVID-19, medium to low, may be rising slightly. Vacancy still at around a record low. Demand still reasonably firm. Supply rising, but from a low base. Rent more or less stable. GDP numbers, yes, this year will be difficult, but, uh, but, but there should be a reasonable rebound next year. Overall, it is still appropriate to characterize Japan as a market favoring landlords. Pre commitment levels remain high, they exceed 83% for this year. 39% for next year, although we hear some occupiers are trying to pull out. The one year delay to the Olympics may dent confidence in the market this year, but support confidence and activity in 2021. Last but not least, Australia really just going in to the COVID-19 downturn. You can see current disruption high. Just look at these GDP growth forecasts, really all over the place. <laughs> Forecasters, forecasters are busy uh, trying to adjust to what is going on to Australia. There will be a sharp downturn this year, which, this, which sadly breaks the country's 30-year record of unbroken growth. But again, uh, we should see uh, a significant upswing, hopefully see a significant upswing next year. Right now, demand is moderating from high levels. Rent is moderating from high le levels. Demand and supply uh, Sorry, vacancy and supply looks set to rise. So the situation in which Australia was a landlord, a uh, market favoring landlords with strong employment trends driving up rents in Sydney and Melbourne, that I'm afraid is over. Right now, COVID-19 disruption levels are rising. Tenants are delaying decision making. We're seeing strong contingency work, strong demand for contingency work from home plans. But overall, this is still a clean, health conscious country with a world leading healthcare system, Singapore and Australia are the two safe havens for occupiers in the region right now. Back to Sam. Fantastic, Andrew. Thank you so much for that uh, update. Um, I think what is very obvious to see is that there's no doubt there's a significant amount of challenges for the rest of this year. Looking at those numbers there, Andrew, uh, positivity for 2021. And um, what I would say is obviously the speed of evolution. Um, you know, when we sat down 24 hours ago, Andrew, and uh, we did a dry run. China hadn't announced the, the uptick in manufacturing numbers, uh, which again has had a significant change to some of these slides literally as of today. So it is really important that people keep on top of these things, you know, continually reach out to us so that we can give you real time information around how uh, the metrics and the trends we're seeing are impacting uh, you and your portfolios. So I just want to go now onto the key impacts before we go through to the, uh, the recommendations. And the three impacts here, uh, Andrew's already touched on the increased vacancy and depressed rents. Um, I think the, the primary question here at the moment is, will it become a, a, a tenant's market? Uh, we haven't necessarily seen that move yet, but we do realize that there's little activity in the marketplace. Transactions are not being completed, uh, but at this stage, uh, there still seems to be some demand um, and rents whilst um, fluid, uh, we do see that they will be going down between now and the end of the year. Has that led, in, as I say, to point number two into deferred uh, occupancy and expansion? Uh, again, 
we, although we're probably a, a further ahead than both the US and Europe in terms of what is happening in our markets, this again is changing day to day. There's no doubt that there's a lot of deferment, but it's very hard to say whether that deferment is leading to cancellation or just decisions being put on hold. And we're also seeing decisions being put on hold for a number of different reasons as well. And, and in occasion, that's not just a business decision based in Asia. That is as much to do with the fact that a lot of the stakeholders, the C-suites, the decision makers of multinationals in Asia are based in Europe and the US, and they're focused on their people and the challenges around their own risk mitigation and business continuity in their, H, in their HQ locations and making sure that their people welfare are okay. So we also see the disruption that's caused in other markets will mean there is a continued deferment of Occupy expansion in 2020. But we don't at the moment, as I say, see people necessarily putting out of transactions or putting things on hold indefinitely. But what it has definitely led to is an increased demand for remote working. Um, we've talked about this extensively, you know, working from home or remote working has been a trend that has been increasing over the last couple of years, but I don't think anyone saw it to, to this extent. And so it's going to be interesting to see over the next few weeks as to how well the remote from working has held up. You know, China has called this uh, the greatest work from home experiment. Uh, and I think that is probably a very, very good way of looking at it. I think there's going to be a lot of positivity. It's definitely changed the mindset around how people view working from home. And it's definitely put increased demand on technology and the need for infrastructure to support it. But from what we've seen so far, it has been relatively positive. Again, Polyas at the moment is carrying out a, a survey with all of our clients and internal staff uh, to understand how exactly this work from home policy has uh, proceeded and whether or not it's been successful and areas that we feel need to change, adapt and evolve over time. Uh, that uh, survey is currently being uh, run. We will anal analyze it in the next couple of weeks and we'll have our results out to uh, this working group, all of our clients across the globe by the middle of April. Now, moving on to the bit that uh, James and I are going to run through now, we want to go through the recommendations. Um, we try to fit these into four recommendations. Realistically, there are three areas to focus on, which is really those short, those medium, and those long term. I'm going to spend a little bit more time today on the short term. That's the slide you've got in front of you. Uh, that's around the creative lease opportunities. This is where the immediate opportunities are, where the questions that we're currently being asked sort of fit into one of these four buckets. And these four buckets, really looking from left to right, are based on how much time and how much analysis we are able to do to determine how much or how many recommendations we can make. But I think everyone at the moment and over the last month or so has been looking at the immediate opportunities. So what are those immediate opportunities? So it may sound simple, but our recommendations have been to put out your lease and review it in detail. Understand your force majeure clauses, understand the clauses you have in there that are anything to do with the way you occupy space. Make sure that you're engaged with a service provider like ourselves, but also make sure that you engage with your own legal and financial teams as well to make sure you're getting a full update on what and what isn't possible. What I would say in these situations is that whilst we're talking about occupiers today, landlords are also going through their own challenges. We've been working with our valuations teams as well to make sure that when we're making recommendations for occupiers, we also understand the valuation element from a landlord perspective, to make sure that we're taking both both parties into account. Ultimately, there are three key areas that we feel we should focus on. One is constant communication with landlords. Don't just stop paying rent, communicate. Make sure you create and build on the relationship. Uh, people have leases and landlords. It's a longer term relationship. You need to make sure that you are leveraging that and making sure you're fully transparent in terms of the way you're discussing uh, your own internal business challenges with your landlord so they can resonate and understand where your requests are coming from. Ultimately, you need to document everything and every piece of communication. Yeah. Do not assume at this stage that the landlord is going, to rent, is going to grant a rent deferral. Make sure you're looking at the longer term, the longer term relationship piece here, not only the longer term in terms of how you occupy space. And it sounds, again, simple, but it's important. Negotiate rather than litigate. And this is something that's been mentioned to me on a number of occasions. Communication dialogue is significantly 
more uh, significantly better at this stage. There are a number of different strategies here. Yeah, and we're going more into the blend and extend. Yeah, Andrew mentioned their Singapore and rental rises. Yeah, is there an opportunity to reduce rent but extend your lease? Otherwise, is there opportunities to take a rental holiday, amortize that back over the life cycle of the lease or a longer lease? And there are a number of different ways that we see at the moment to perhaps get some kind of relief in 2020 that gives a longer term commitment to a landlord or maybe amortizes some of that rent free over a longer period. Again, these are very fluid. We've worked with a number of clients on a number of different initiatives, and we'd be delighted to speak to you about those and uh, work out what might suit you, uh, your current business situation and your portfolio. A little bit more on the medium term of, of short term is sort of create flexibility. Um, yeah, we've talked about a recommendation previously around agile working. I think there's an opportunity now with things like social and um, in terms of uh, making sure people aren't too close together is making sure that obviously there's agility and that people are very aware of how they fit into an office as people are coming back in to maximize the productivity. Uh, flexible workplace is still something that we see as a medium term solution. Maybe in the short term, there's a concern around the social distancing aspect, but in the long term, medium term, then we see this as a, a way of adding flexibility to the portfolio. And also goes out saying that you know, be aware of your immediate expiries. Make sure you're leveraging those to your benefit. Holdovers, you know, landlords are now more willing to entertain in, in holdovers to provide yourself that flexibility in the short run. For those of you who've got more time, and I think an area that we really are beginning to see, particularly after the first month of sort of the panic phase is over, more clients are asking for advice around their entire portfolio in terms of how they occupy the space. You know, are they over rented? Can they take a, an optimization or a rationalization approach to the portfolio to get a better, more effective, more productive um, business? You know, are they taking into account any government incentives that may be coming down the line? Again, these are areas that are continually changing and uh, you need to watch this space to understand exactly what is happening here. But suffice to say, the portfolio optimization and the ability to sit down and strategize over where the portfolio is going, so coming out of this in a stronger position, is something we're significantly focused on and we can add significant value to our clients. Recommendation two, um, the adoption of the remote working. I touched that on the last page and a lot of this builds on what we've already seen I guess evolving over the last year or two, but we feel that this in terms of the recommendations from a medium term perspective are going to be increasing. Andrew talked earlier about decentralization. We've seen that as a cost saving initiative. With the introduction of more technology based workforce, the ability to work anywhere has meant that people are able to work in, in, in different locations and in a number of ways save money. We've also seen now under COVID-19 the importance of decentralization from a business continuity perspective, mitigating the risk of having everyone in one location. But ultimately, this comes down to a cost reduction initiative. We touched on flex earlier. That flexible workspace is, I think, going to come to a fore. We're, we're seeing a change in the way the flexible workplace operators utilize their space. Once the social distancing uh, comes to an end, people are going to look to flex and core. The idea of taking a core their core business, you know, the business that they know is fixed in a main in a main building with a landlord in a traditional manner, and then using the flexible workspace to both ramp up and to then bring down workforces depending on how market conditions impact the business. Yep. Partnering with flexible workplace operators is going to be key, and we're seeing an increase in amenities there, which also plays into the wellness element that James is going to touch on. Later. But all of this is underpinned by um, technology and the cloud infrastructure. I think the bit that we've all seen that is beginning to stand the test of time is that migration towards technology and the ability for more people to work from home in a more functional, effective, and productive manner. For example, today we're all on webinar. Yeah, webinar is something that's only been going for the last six to 12 months, and now we're doing a huge amount of connectivity and collaboration with our clients around webinar and things like Zoom and Skype, et cetera. And this has just meant that it's an easier to remain connected. If we move to the right hand side, I think the bit that is of interest is, I think we've, we've broken the sort of stigma of people need to be in the office to be seen. It's now all about productivity and results. And you can see that remotely. There's no doubt there's been an enhanced IT infrastructure. Yet the business now technology enabled, which will, release, will lead to less space. 
will that ultimately lead to you know, a reduction in net lease area and save up, you know, save real estate costs? Absolutely, there's no doubt. But I think a lot of this comes with the unknown of will this increase productivity? Again, as we come to the end of this, we do the analysis, we'll get a better, clear idea around whether productivity is being enhanced because ultimately that is the key for all of our occupiers in terms of how they occupy real estate and what the future looks like. I just want to hand this over now to James. James um, is based in Australia. Uh, I want to talk a little bit around the technology aspects. Yeah, Australia has been at the forefront of this. James, do you just want to give us an update in terms of the recommendations you've been giving your clients and how well or how well the adoption of technology has been received over the last two, two to three months? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Always had a good place for, for this region. Our sort of four pillars are strategy, space planning, people and operations, which involves IT as well. But our occupiers, especially you know, previously to COVID-19 and due to previous you know, low vacancy, they've really been increasing density, looking for new leases for, for projects or special projects or acquisitions. And obviously Flex definitely comes in, into play. Uh, from an IT perspective and on the ground, from an operational point of view, we now have a huge amount of our workforce working from home from the for the first time. They've never thought about working from home. Their roles are never considered to be able to be performed at home. And that's definitely created a lot of challenges um, for, for most of our corporate occupiers and, and beyond. Uh, connectivity has definitely increased, but more is needed. And that, that's happening. Telcos are working overtime at the moment to support that. Um, our telco um, providers here in Australia are you know, bringing on more and more people as others are obviously having to shed those costs. Uh, licenses costs, you know, costs in regards to like Citrix licenses, you know, things like video conferencing, you know, telcos. And I think we've all probably seen that increased traffic um, and not being able to get onto webinars or teleconferences as easily. That's certainly something to ease over the last probably week, maybe two weeks. Um, the at-home IT infrastructure is probably the biggest concern for us here at the moment. Um, we'll touch on that a little bit later under wellness, but the key takeaways from an IT perspective and what we're looking and projecting forward on is we've been working really rapidly to you know, get people working from home, get all that happening, but we've got now people on personal devices, we've got confidentiality in regards to documents, so we've got now personal data on, you know, company data on personal devices, and then also we've got the concern about networks and security updates where they may need to be on a network but are not able to do so because actually working from home. So I think that this has definitely been the, you know, last week was probably the you know, largest experiment ever of working from home. It's actually, it's, it's now a reality. Uh, this is the new norm um, and we're ready for it. And that's probably the exciting part from my side. Thanks, James. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, just while I've got you, uh, obviously moving into wellness, um, we've seen how important that is, you know, with the human element of COVID-19. Um, again, Australia has traditionally led the way from an Asia-Pacific perspective. You know, Asia, we are catching up quickly, but it would be good to see how your clients are reacting to this and some of the recommendations you've been giving them as well. Well, I'd like to think that Australia has been very well advanced in the whole health and wellbeing as a benefit, as an employee benefit. Um, and you know, things like, you know, IT devices, working from home has always been a major aspect of what we do. Um, this has obviously really pushed us to do more of that. Uh, currently, we've got a lot of clients that are providing one-off grants to their employees for IT devices, special equipment. Ergonomics has been a, a big factor. So, you know, providing subsidies for them to go and buy a chair or, you know, buy a table, et cetera, that actually fits the ergonomic requirements. Um, but I, I think the number one thing is really trying to fit into the attraction or retention strategy of those clients, of those occupiers. You know, the fight for talent has never been stronger. Um, health and wellbeing has always been a huge benefit and a consideration for, especially also the, the graduates that are coming out, looking at where they go. It's always been employees over the last probably 24 months, employees have been able to choose their employer. Um, on the other side of this, we're obviously going to see a, a shift in that. It's really going to come back to, it's going to be an employer choice. We're going to have a huge market of a lot of people, unfortunately, have you know, lost their 
lost their jobs, lost their careers, and may also make that change. So that's the shift that we'll probably see on the other side of COVID-19. Thanks, James. All right, having a couple of recommendations, I'm just going to wrap this up now in the last in the last couple of minutes, and then we just want to go through what are the key takeaways from uh, today's session. You can see here we split this into the two buckets, um, you know, those near-term, shorter-term sort of focus area recommendations. And um, you know, we talked earlier about looking for opportunities straight away. There's definitely a first mover advantage, so make sure you're you're communicating and you're respecting the landlord, but at the same time, uh, looking for opportunities there around how to take immediate relief that will impact your businesses in 2020. And I think there's opportunities, it's about doing it the right way. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, portfolio analysis. You know, Colliers has a proprietary tool, Colliers Office Expert, which analyzes portfolios. This is something that we are seeing a number of our clients asking us to undertake. It is extremely powerful. It allows us to come up with a number of different recommendations particularly around sort of the financial aspects around how our clients and potential clients are occupying space at this time and to really show where those savings can be made. Now we talked about um, the contingency and the BCP earlier. You know, while social distancing is still a key aspect, and as people go back to the office you know, over the next weeks and months, social distancing will still be something that is prevalent. So how people occupy space and is going to be absolutely critical. And that's something that I think people need to take into account, but at the moment isn't necessarily on the radar. Uh, technology, um, yeah, as James has just touched, um, it, it is in its in its infancy in terms of a work from home on this sort of scale, but so far it seems to have worked well. As James said, it is the new normal, but we'll know more over the next few months when we're able to do the analysis to understand what does and doesn't. As we move to the sort of mid to longer term, um, we touched base on the decentralization, that sort of risk mitigation of having everyone in one location, which is a cost, a cost element as well. No doubt the wellness aspect, uh, as people are looking, um, you know, or, or members of staff, employees are looking for wellness as an integral part of the way they occupy space, that is going to be something that I think we'll be focusing on more and more. And we have a webinar coming up on that in the next week. Please look out for that. We'll send out details soon. Agile working, uh, just in the way that the efficiency and effectiveness that improves the productivity of working environment, that is something that I think can add significantly to the bottom line if done well. And then after that, it really is what does remote working look like? You know, how many people are based in the office? How many people work off site? How do you maintain the DNA and how do you maintain the cultural structure of the company at the same time as uh, navigating a world of how employees want to utilize office space and obviously. Uh, the cost of doing so. It just leaves me to say thank you very much to everyone for joining today. Um, I hope you found this useful. Please reach out to uh, Andrew, James, or myself for further information. I know a lot of you are already in contact with a number of the Colliers teams around the region, and uh, they will continue to support and help guide in any way they can. And um, what we've got here, if you want to click on uh, the checklist of services to understand really where the areas we can potentially help you are or the areas you need to think about please click on here fill that in send it back to us it's a bit of an aid memoir it can help us from a diagnostic perspective really get into the crux of some of the challenges you're going through so we can come up with a, a solution and a remedy in real time as quickly as possible that adds value to your businesses and it goes without saying that you know, we've now released uh, the microsite which has been up and running for the last six weeks that has all of our up-to-date research, including everything Andrew has presented today in real time. It also has all of these webinars on there. It also has a number of the different recommendations based on the occupier, have the flexible workplace uh, solutions. We'll have wellness coming up, and we'll also have our report on uh, our report on uh, the working from home experiment coming up over the next couple of weeks. We'll continue to send out updates on that, but please keep up to date. Please use that as something that is being real time provides real time recommendations. It leads me to say thank you on behalf of Collius for joining us today. Uh, stay safe and uh, we look forward to connecting with you all again soon.